Thanks to Wondrium for sponsoring this video. This is Fred Kaufman. He's a former exec at LinkedIn and Google, who worked as Google's vice president of leadership and development. And he had a very interesting way of describing his job. He called himself Google's chief spiritual officer. According to him, the larger purpose of business is not to succeed, but to serve as a theater for self-knowledge, self-actualization, and self-transcendence. Kaufman is not alone. Many human resource professionals at Silicon Valley Tech companies have started to view the workplace as having a spiritual dimension. Companies should thus nurture the spiritual well-being of their employees. To accomplish this goal, they've hired executive coaches that are described as spiritual advisors, they've launched meditation and mindfulness courses led by Buddhist monks, and they've increasingly become the primary institutions where Silicon Valley tech employees find community, meaning, and identity in their day-to-day -day lives. Which raises the question, is work replacing religion? In a recent book, Work, Pray, Code, the sociologist Carolyn Chen aimed to study religion in what appears to be on paper one of the least traditionally religious places in the U.S., Silicon Valley in Northern California. After interviewing workers at these companies and studying their leadership and work culture, Chen concluded that the tech companies of Silicon Valley are blurring the lines that used to exist between religion and work. Google, Facebook, Intel, eBay, Netflix, PayPal, Twitter, and more are all adopting key elements of religious organizations, offering ideology and rituals, and even fostering communities where workers feel a sense of belonging and transcendent identity. I spoke to Dr. Chen about Work, Pray, Code earlier this year. So in my book, I argue that work is replacing religion in Silicon Valley. And what I mean by that is that... Uh, Tech workers are looking to work to fulfill their needs for identity, belonging, meaning, and purpose. And these are once um, needs that these are needs that Americans once turned to their religions to fulfill, their faith communities to fulfill. On the other side, what we see is that corporations, particularly the tech companies that I studied, are starting to take up spiritual care as part of their management practice, essentially to make their workers more productive. Now, to be clear, Dr. Chen specifically focused on the elite professions of Silicon Valley tech companies. But in these elite workplaces, she argues that we're witnessing a fundamental shift in the relationship between employer and employee, a relationship that's not simply economic, but supposedly more nurturing, and dare I say it, more pastoral. Now, before we continue, we should talk for a second about what it means to compare things to religion. The discipline religious studies is sometimes called comparative religion. Many academic have found it useful to compare two or more religions or rituals in order to better understand an element that they share. For example, scholars will use a cross-cultural term like priesthood to compare religions that share the element of an ordained religious functionary who carries out specific rituals, whether that's a Shinto priest in Japan or a Catholic priest in Boston. Another technique is to compare seemingly non-religious things with religious things. For example, in a past video, I compared the behavior that Americans show toward the American flag to religious rituals. Comparison can be a really useful way to study religion and see it in unexpected places. And yet, at the same time, this has led to what I think is one of the laziest and most overused tropes in all of journalism and punditry. The equation, X is a religion. You've probably seen this before. It's often used as a derogatory comparison, like when people say that Apple is a religion because Apple fanboys are ecstatic to buy the next Apple product, or when young earth creationist Ken Ham says evolutionary science is a religion because it involves some level of trust or faith that scientific data is correct. Superficial comparisons like this often fall apart under scrutiny because people don't compare responsibly. As the academic Jonathan Z. Smith argued, the equation X resembles Y is a logically incomplete statement. Comparative religion should never simply compare two things without qualification. Comparison is at least a three-factor equation. X resembles Y more than Z with respect to something. That something is whatever you're studying. Sometimes it's a question or a theory or a concept, but in any case, the scholar or journalist or YouTube pundit must defend the something part of their equation, defend their use of that something as serving a purpose that highlights certain features as academically significant. As Smith says, a comparison is a disciplined exaggeration in the service of knowledge. 
In other words, comparison is a strategy of redescription, redescribing something in such a way that helps us think about the topic in a new and more productive way, ultimately helping us understand the topic more deeply. But the operative phrase here is a disciplined exaggeration. An undisciplined exaggeration would look something like this. Work is a religion, let me show you. The invisible hand of the market functions like an all-knowing, all-powerful god. The saints are billionaires and corporate CEOs. The Wall Street Journal is the sacred text that works out the will of the market. The chair of the Federal Reserve is the market's oracle and prophet. This sort of checklist-style comparison usually doesn't help us think about the topic in a more productive way. It's based more on rhetoric than empirical data. For example, calling economists the high priests of the religion of capitalism is based simply on rhetoric. A careful comparison of how a high priest functions in a real culture, like ancient Israelite religion, would show the comparison is surface level at best. But returning to sociologist Carolyn Chen, what makes her work so interesting is that it's a disciplined comparison of religion and Silicon Valley work culture. She's the first to admit that Silicon Valley tech companies are not religious in the more stereotypical or systematized way that we understand the term as it relates to religions like Christianity or Buddhism. But when she compares work to religion, she includes that critical part of the equation. With respect to. Work is like religion with respect to how human resource professionals in Silicon Valley have implemented programs that foster a strong sense of belonging, identity, and meaning, or how companies encourage employees to discover their true, authentic selves through work things that are often relegated to the realm of religious institutions. Of course, religion is way more than just belonging, identity, meaning-making, and self-actualization. But by making this disciplined exaggeration, Chen's book highlights certain features about the work culture in Silicon Valley that helps us understand empirically verifiable human behavior in a more nuanced way. All right, that's the end of the theory and method portion of this video. Now it's time to talk about three of Dr. Chen's most interesting discoveries. The diffusion of religion into the workplace, where spiritual practices like mindfulness are repurposed into productivity tools. Second, the new role that companies are playing as they help workers search for meaning. And finally, the concept of corporate maternalism, which describes how companies aim to provide holistic personal care that makes their employees happier, healthier, and more productive. The secular diffusion of religion is when people take practices from religion and repackage them for the corporate work experience, especially as tools to optimize their work performance. And Silicon Valley tech culture seems to be enamored with certain Eastern religious traditions, especially Buddhism and Hinduism. For example, in 2007, the Google engineer Chade Mengtan founded a six-week course for Google employees called Search Inside Yourself. The course aimed to foster mindfulness and emotional intelligence for Google employees, drawing heavily from Buddhist-inspired belief and practice. The course featured Buddhist teachers as guests, and the course trained attendees in practices like meditation in order to unlock your full potential at work and in life. And Google is not alone by employing ritualized practices for boosting employees' mental, physical, and spiritual well-being. Apple, LinkedIn, and other Silicon Valley companies have meditation rooms for their employees at their headquarters. In other places, you know, twice a week they had meditation and then they had, they didn't call it a Dharma teaching, but the person who, <laughs> the meditation teacher who led it called it a Dharma teaching and very much, you know, it, it was very much a Dharma teaching, one that you would hear in a temple and really no different. The way that they treated meditation was that it was a, uh, essentially a way to optimize the mind. This is part of a broader trend. One study found that 22% of American companies incorporate mindfulness training, including big name companies like Aetna, McKinsey, and Nike. Many others offer their employees opportunities to engage in Asian spiritual practices, such as yoga, meditation, and chanting Sanskrit mantras, all of which are removed from any clear affiliation with their roots and traditions like Hinduism or Buddhism. Practices that once made sense within a broader cultural and historical framework associated with these these religions are now embedded in the culture of the workplace and are even commodified. This trend of American corporations integrating Asian religious traditions into their work culture has a clear history. Some of the same people who are now managers and human resource professionals in Silicon Valley were once countercultural young people who moved to the area in the 1960s and 70s. Many of these people were drawn to Asian religious, spiritual, and mystical practices that were gaining popularity during the same era, especially in the Bay Area. Yeah. <laughs> 
Business icons like Steve Jobs were drawn to Tibetan and Zen Buddhism, as well as yoga and meditation. Larry Ellison and the founder of Salesforce, Mark Benioff, are known to practice meditation as well. Chen calls this first generation of Silicon Valley workers the mystics. She calls the modern generation of tech workers the users. They're more into self-hacking, using religious, spiritual, or mystical practices as productivity tools to optimize their work performance, whether it's microdosing on psychedelics or engaging and Buddhist-inspired mindfulness techniques. This first example, the secular diffusion of religion, is pretty straightforward. Companies bring religious practices into the workplace. But another way that work can be religious is more ideological. Chen argues that these companies are not just economic institutions. They've become meaning-making institutions that offer fulfillment and divine purpose. We already hinted at this with Fred Kaufman, that Google exec who called himself the company's chief spiritual officer. Kaufman went on to say that companies should look beyond simple economic incentives and motivate employees by appealing to more spiritual incentives. He says a conscious organization's goal in the personal realm is to promote the self-actualization and self-transcendence of everyone it touches. Kaufman is one example of a growing trend in Silicon Valley human resource departments to encourage people to find their authentic self through their work. Chen interviewed dozens of high-level managers in Silicon Valley, and she found that they overwhelmingly described their work not as managers, but as coaches or supporters. One even described his work as the head pastor of his company who helps people be who they want to be. The executive coaches that I spoke to in Silicon Valley very much saw their task as being very spiritual, helping people get in touch with what they would call their authentic self, and that the sense that again, is that if they could align that deepest part of themselves with the work that they did, then this was a you know, this was this was a boon for the company. And it's not just human resource professionals who say work should be a place of meaning making and self actualization. Employees themselves are increasingly viewing their work like this as well. In her interview, she found that many employees describe their work as part of their spiritual journey. Other employees describe their work as a sacred journey or pilgrimage of self discovery. And studies have shown that high earners are more likely to say that work gives them a sense of identity. It was really interesting because when I went to Silicon Valley, I too expected it to be a place where there wouldn't be much religion. It wouldn't be a very spiritual place because uh, Silicon Valley, the Bay Area, is one of the least religious areas in the United States. However, when I went there and I started to conduct my interviews, and I conducted over inter 100 interviews in total, you know, people started to tell me these stories about how they had become more whole, more spiritual. Um, how they became more authentic, uh, became their real selves uh, after moving to Silicon Valley and also because of their workplaces. The third aspect we'll examine here is what Chen calls corporate maternalism. Basically, this is when companies take care of all of the non-productive parts of a worker's life, like exercise, hobbies, and eating. One exec at Facebook, for example, said more and more knowledge industry companies are not just fulfilling basic needs. They're aiming to fulfill every need. And companies do this by turning the workplace into a village where all your social and material needs can be met, whether that's through meals, childcare, social functions, or coming to see your colleagues as your closest friends and even family. Well, in a knowledge economy where essentially the value is through innovation, your most important asset is your human worker. It's your human capital, essentially. And so how do you grow the value of your company? So you can invest in the skills of your worker, but the other way that you invest in them is that you invest in them spiritually. So when I would talk to human resources professionals, you know, again, when I asked them, would you describe what, your what you do in your job? It was, they would often use these terms of like care and nurturing, like nurturing the souls of the employees, taking care of them so that they could work harder. There was a lot of care involved in that. And so that's what I call that sort of corporate maternalism, that sort of care 
of body, mind, and spirit that the company is providing for their workers. Corporate maternalism might help explain some broader social trends that we see in the U.S. about the changing relationship between religion and work. First of all, work is simply consuming more time for these types of workers. While the average American works fewer hours than they did decades ago, college-educated high-earning workers, especially men, are working more than they previously did. And in fact, according to one study, the richest 10% of married American men had the longest average work week out of any other group. Moreover, the younger generations that tend to work at these types of tech companies are already less religious in the first place. The continued rise of religiously unaffiliated people suggests that Americans, especially younger Americans, are already not finding meaning and belonging in more traditional religious communities. And cities where knowledge industries congregate, like Washington, D.C., San Jose, California, and Cambridge, Massachusetts, are across the board among the least religious places in the U.S., with very low rates of affiliation. In these decidedly non-religious places, corporations replace the social function of religious institutions. They've become places to socialize, find friendships, romantic partners, emotional support, and personal meaning. Chen's book hits on a topic that many may regard as a new dystopia, and concern about work, money, or capitalism replacing religion seems to pop up again and again decade after decade. Back in 1999, the theologian Harvey Cox wrote an article for The Atlantic in which he argued that Americans now worship the invisible hand of the market as a new god. Twenty years later, again in The Atlantic, the journalist Derek Thompson argued that workism is a new religion competing for congregants, which is the belief that work is not only necessary to economic production, but also the centerpiece of one's identity and life's purpose. These think pieces seem to arise out of Americans waking up to a new status quo in the United States, addressing what Chen calls a silent and growing absence of belonging. Fewer and fewer people are participating in civic associations, unions, and religious organizations. The sociologist Robert Putnam famously identified this trend of declining social capital in his book Bowling Alone. Associations ranging from churches to bowling leagues have all undergone massive declines in membership. Faced with this new status quo, Chen asks, what institutions do we turn to now for belonging and purpose in life? For many elite tech workers, the answer is no longer a religious community, but rather the institution that dominates every aspect of their life. To paraphrase Dr. Chen, maybe tech employees are worshipping work because they feel work has become worthy of worship. Thanks to Wondrium for sponsoring this video. Wondrium is an online learning platform with a ton of educational video content. Seriously, it's really hard to emphasize just how big Wondrium's library is. They offer content on so many different topics. So let's say you're into traveling. I just returned home to the States after two years abroad in Egypt, hence the change of scenery with my background here. And when I was abroad, I'd consult Wondrium's content on ancient Egypt when I would visit different archaeological sites. They're constantly adding new content too, like the brand new series Traveling the Roman Empire which journeys through the different provinces of the Roman Empire guided by my friend and colleague, the archaeologist Darius Aria. For those of you who like traveling and the outdoors, they also just launched a new series called America's Great Trails. In this series, you join the documentary filmmaker Mick Davey along six of America's most beloved trails, including the Pacific Northwest Trail, the Continental Divide Trail, and of course, the Appalachian Trail. Each episode focuses on a different trail and features absolutely stunning photography. If you'd like to sign up, Wondrium is offering a free trial to the Religion for Breakfast audience. Head on over to wondrium.com slash religionforbreakfast or click the link in the comments below to get started. Thanks, everyone.